Welcome. Uh, we switched the rooms at the last minute, so if you're here for a Jeb talk, uh, I think it's across the hall now. Um, if you're here for the car, then uh, you're in the right place. All right, so what do we have here? We have a project called Galisno Car, self-driving car and micronet, or sometimes self-driving. Uh, I am Ryan Vanderwerf. I work at OCI and the Grails team, and I also help work on micronet sometimes. So um, that's where a lot of the stuff comes from. I'm a father of two kiddos, six and 13. I help run a local Groovy Grills group in Austin, Texas. That's where I'm from. I've helped uh, co-authored an effective Gradle implementation video series and packed with this guy over here. He'll introduce himself in a second. I like to modify all kinds of things like these cars or real cars or computers or phones or whatever. All those things are fun. I'm also into lots of DevOps stuff. In my previous job before OCI, I did a lot of that stuff. I also do a lot of conversational AI, a la Alexa or Google Home. So talk to me if you need any Grails, Groovy, or Micronaut support uh, at OCI. We can help you out. All right, give, take it over to Lee. All right, my name is Lee Fox. Uh, I'm a cloud architect uh, for a company called Infor. Um, I've got two sons, 15 and 7, just a little bit older than Ryan's kids. I also have a wife, and I'm smart enough not to reveal her age. Uh, I, um, I'm an agile DevOps and chat ops evangelist working uh, in uh, these areas and trying to spread the good word for, uh, for a long time now. Uh, really, to do that, I have to get involved with uh, communities. So uh, I love user groups, uh, Agile Austin back home, do, uh, Cloud Austin, uh, DevOps. I'm trying to, to see if I can't bridge out uh, beyond that uh, area for um, user groups, but we'll see how that goes. Um, Alexa developer along with him. You should check out some of our published Alexa skills. Shameless plug. And I'm also an amateur chef. So uh, let's go ahead and, and kick into this today. I think you forgot something. You need a new PowerPoint technician. <laughs> <laughs> and I love PowerPoint. So um, our agenda today, we're going to talk about the, uh, the car project, uh, talking about these two uh, vehicles over here. The, uh, uh, the one on the left, the white one, we have named Vander Fox One. And uh, very creatively, the black one on the right, we've called Vander Fox Two. Um, we're going to look at the hardware for these vehicles. We'll look at the software. Ryan will come in and, and tell us about that. And then we'll talk about the, uh, the future of where this project's going to go and the things that we, we see happening with Vander Fox 1 and 2 and hopefully their future siblings 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So with that, uh, let's get started with the project. <clears throat> we, um, we wanted to take this... Uh, to the next level, kind of uh, um, inspired by this, this NVIDIA uh, Drive uh, video, and I think this is going to play. Nope, it's not. We took the video out. Cool. So um, it's, uh, it's kind of like our RC uh, full-size vehicle in terms of it uses a single camera to process uh, visual data, and um, it uh, takes the images and telemetry and the information and submits it to a neural network to uh, begin to make decisions, kind of like how you and I would drive a car. We, we see things, we observe, we take in information, we make decisions on, on how to, uh, to um, control the vehicle. So there's a lot of uh, vehicles out there um, currently doing this. The Cadillac Super Cruise, we have uh, Teslas. Um, these don't cost as, as much as those vehicles, no, but no, uh, no, no. We, we do have uh, Vanderfox 1 and Vanderfox 2 to add to, uh, to the pool. Um, the hardware for, for these uh, is surprisingly surprisingly easy and um, the the other surprise is that it's cheap each one of these rigs is about um, it's it's under two hundred dollars us to to get uh, the um, we've got information about the prices and, and such in here the only uh, thing to keep in mind if you want to build either of these two specific cars is um, the actual RC chassis is a little hard to find but let's let's talk about that so here's the the chassis and it is uh, built on the Exceed Magnet truck. 
It's 116 scale, and it's available for about 100 uh, US. Here is the best link that we have found to, uh, to get one of these vehicles. Uh, but um, this is an older model car, and it's uh, been periodically out of stock. And uh, right now, um, the projects that are using uh, this technology are really liking this car, so people keep buying it up. Uh, when we fought, uh, bought Vander Fox 1, uh, we didn't have any problems finding one, and it was like two weeks later we decided, oh, we need a second car so that we, wouldn't, we weren't fighting over the... Uh, um, the, the single vehicle, and it was sold out worldwide. So uh, something to keep in mind about that. The processing for this is driven by a Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, it's a 1.2 gig, 64-bit quad uh, processor. It's got an ARM CPU on it. One gig of RAM. Um, it's got a wireless adapter in it and uh, a camera interface, which is important. The, the camera interface is... Uh, it's right dead center next to the, uh, the HDMI port. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of the things that makes the Raspberry Pi very, very uh, important for, for this project. We found a couple of other small processors that could have potentially been used, but uh, they didn't have any uh, sort of camera interface for us. Next, there's a servo motor driver. <clears throat> So the, uh, the Raspberry Pi in and of itself doesn't have enough pinouts. It doesn't have uh, the, uh, the ability to uh, do what is known as pulse width modulation. Uh, what it can do, though, is it can send uh, digital signals to, uh, to this um, servo motor driver, and that can do pulse width modulation for us. So uh, we, we found uh, this servo driver. It's a PCA9685, which didn't mean a whole lot to me. Still doesn't. Uh, it's just a model number. It's got 16 channels on it. We are only using two, by the way. Um, we use one channel to uh, control the, uh, the steering servo and then the other to control the throttle servo. It's 12-bit PWM, and uh, the, uh, the most common version that we found is uh, something called Adafruit. Uh, this is nice and cheap. It's only about 12 bucks U.S. Uh, by the way, the Raspberry Pi, I, I just remembered there wasn't a cost on there. That's about 30 bucks U.S. Next comes up uh, the camera. So we've got this wide-angle Raspberry Pi camera, and um, this is uh, designed specifically for the Pi. It's uh, the only uh, visual input, or actually the only input, um, or device giving input to, uh, to the system. Uh, what we see happening is, uh, as the car is looking at telemetry, it's sampling uh, the, uh, the data that it's getting for, uh, for the throttle and for the servos, but it's taking direct input from, from the camera. This is about 30 bucks US. There's a link on Amazon to find it, real easy to get. Now, the car itself has a battery. And uh, the battery is located that down. That was its battery. It is. Yeah. It's located down on the bottom of the chassis. But um, while that uh, battery seems to do a decent job in keeping the car moving for a while, the car does take a lot of draw from it. And uh, we need something to power the, uh, the Pi. It would make sense to, uh, to plug the Pi into a wall socket and then have the car drive around, right? So... Um, for, for two reasons. One, uh, so we didn't have to do any wiring or soldering to tie into that battery. And two, so that we had a, a portable nature. Uh, we're using a portable battery to power the Pi. Uh, this is the, uh, the battery. It's, um, uh, keep in mind, it is not for the, the motor at all. This is just the processing power. And um, as I mentioned, it's because uh, the motor draws a lot, so we couldn't even, I don't even think we could power the car off of that. that no, the Pi gets angry if it's underpowered. It'll start <laughs> crashing, so they have to be separate. 20 bucks US. Uh, there's an Amazon link as well if you're interested. And then this is the interesting, this uh, part, this is the, the piece de resistance. Um, it's a 3D printed roll cage. Uh, it comes in two pieces, so there's uh, the platform on the bottom that mounts the, uh, the Pi on it and the servo board, and then uh, there are places for it to, uh, to mount to uh, the, the vehicle chassis. And then the other part is the roll cage up at the top, which serves as a nice handle as well as a mounting for, for the camera and um, a little bit of protection for, for the Pi. Uh, we have had some occasions where um, the cars have taken off 
in a crazy manner, kind of like a toddler on a six pack of Mountain Dew. And um, <laughs> it's crashed into things. So that gives it a little bit of, of safety. Uh, now, um, there, there are two bits. And um, there are specs out on, on the internet to, uh, to download um, the, uh, these to print them out. The only suggestion that I have on this is uh, if you want to go and print these out yourselves, um, make sure that you buy a 3D printer that is large enough to actually print this out. Mine was about half an inch too big, and we ended up having to, um, to outsource the, uh, the printing of, of these uh, modules. All right, so when we have the um, when we have the the car put together and and um, taken care of uh, assembled, uh, we have to load the software on that. So I'm going to let Ryan talk about the the actual software. Uh, I want to go in and talk about the training of the vehicle. So um, it has n it's nowhere near as bad as training your teenage son to drive. I promise you that. Uh, there are times that it's scary, and, and uh, the car will crash into things probably like I'm sure the teenager will, will do one day, but um, it's not as scary. Uh, what you need is a track. So uh, we have found that basically as long as you have uh, anything with uh, two lines on either side of a road and a center line, then um, it works well enough for uh, the, uh, um, the TensorFlow software to, uh, to make the determinations and will allow it to work. It can be anything. Um, you can do uh, white lines with a yellow line uh, down the middle. It can be dotted. It can be solid. You've seen that uh, out in, uh, in the uh, lobby where we built our track. Uh, I've also seen people uh, talk about uh, taking a piece of drywall out into, um, into the street on the blacktop and then using that to create a, a white line. Uh, it works well. It gives you high contrast, which is important uh, because the, um, the images that the camera takes are full of color images. However, the software is going to convert them all to grayscale as it does its thing. But uh, the drywall will allow you to create a nice high contrast line and still have it wash away in the next rain. You can also go and uh, build a track inside your house. Um, this is a picture that my wife took of me and my teenager uh, putting down a track, and uh, she wasn't too thrilled about it to begin with, but it eventually grew on her. All right, so um, the shape of the track doesn't matter so much. It could be anything. I mean, you could do a loop, you could do a figure eight, you could do curves like we did out here. Uh, you can have a bunch of straightaways on it. The important thing is nice, bright lines. You want a well-lit area. Um, and we, we did find that with a well-lit area, uh, if you come back to it when it's not quite so well-lit, maybe uh, work with the car at noon when it's bright and sunny and then come back at 6 at where, where it's dusky, um, it, it does change the behavior of the car. It can be a variety of materials. I prefer tape. Ryan um, supports the use of, of ribbon for it. Um, if you've got the space, create too. Because the idea here is as long as the, uh, the cars are on a track that have the same characteristics uh, with the, um, the, the color of the lines and such, then uh, the idea is you're actually training the car to, to learn how to make decisions. So you can move it over to something that's relatively close but a different shape, and the car should still be able to navigate itself around that track. Um, this is a brand new image that I haven't seen before. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Okay. So basically, That's I can a see what joke. I can see what's happening here, and um, <laughs> we are going to to train the car. Uh, so uh, you might have seen Ryan and myself out uh, over the last couple of days trying to train the car. And what we're doing is uh, we're basically telling it this: turn left, turn left, turn right, turn left, and showing it a pattern of how to uh, to make turns, and then doing it several times. The um, Oh, and uh, I see where, where this image comes from. Um, keep in mind that when, when you're training it, you are training it for a certain direction around the track. Uh, if you switch the car around and point it the other direction, bad things happen. 
So um, what you need is manual control of the car. Uh, the, the AI is at some point going to, to take over, but there still has to be some way for you to control it. So um, the, uh, the donkey car project that we use has a, a really nice web controller where uh, you've got a web interface and some controls on there to control the car. It takes samples of the, uh, the video coming from the camera so you can see where it's going. You don't even need to be in the same room. There's a lot of latency on that. So there's also an option for using a game controller, just a, a regular uh, PS3? Yeah, PS3 controller. PS3 controller uh, to, uh, to make that happen. And we find that to be the best way to, to train it. Uh, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna teach the car by example. You are going to manually um, move the car around the track. And uh, you want about 10 to 20 laps of uh, whatever your track is. Uh, that's uh, some of the best practices that we've heard about from talking to the community. And what happens is as the car is moving, it's going to record data. It's going to grab images uh, from the camera. It's going to uh, look and, and sample the car telemetry, how fast it's going, what angles are the wheels uh, pointing in at uh, the time that the images are taken. And then um, all that stuff gets put together in a place where you go to train it. So uh, you will then run a process that takes all of that data and it's going to look at each image and say at this point in time, uh, how fast was a car moving, what, uh, what direction were the wheels going based upon what I see, and it's going to teach itself to, uh, to make decisions about how to speed up, how to slow down, and how to make turns. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Ryan to uh, talk us through the project um, of what we actually have running on this car. All right. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the software components here that are kind of, there's a whole stack of stuff running on this car. So we're running uh, Micronaut on the car. Uh, we're running a library inside of Micronaut called Robo4j. Uh, that's controlling the servos and the motors. Uh, we're using a uh, layer of top of uh, TensorFlow called Keras that's got a, what they call a pilot. Um, and then TensorFlow underneath that, which is actually driving the car right now. Uh, this is based off of a uh, port of Donkey Car, so that's uh, currently still using the TensorFlow Keras part uh, until A, TensorFlow supports the Pi, which they don't currently because of a build tool called Bazel. Uh, doesn't make JNI libraries for 32-bit uh, systems. Uh, so we're going to do, once we f get past that, we're going to switch to deep learning for J, which is a all Java uh, deep learning library alternative. So here's all the components that we've got uh, put together here. We've got, oh, we got laser. All right. Yeah, so we've got Micronaut, Robo for J. Uh, we've got a library called uh, JR PyCam that's taking pictures of it while you're manually controlling the car through Micronaut. And then once uh, you're inside of the Micronaut UI, you switch over to uh, autopilot mode, and what it does is it creates a thread and f runs this stack here, right? And so that stuff takes over and starts self-driving around. And then uh, when the user switches the UI back to auto uh, manual mode, we kill this whole chain of stuff uh, running as a separate thread and keep going. So. Yeah, uh, keep in mind that uh, while the, the project itself is Java, um, because of that, that TensorFlow issue, all the automated self-driving is still a call out to Python code. So that one Python script there is a bastardized Python code from the Donkey Car project. All right, so let's talk a little about Micronaut. Uh, I think we've probably all heard about what Micronaut is now at this point, but I'll briefly just go over it. We've just got a modern JVM-based full-stack framework. Um, we've had a few talks on it already, so. This is yet another application for that. Uh, what's really cool about it, we've got built-in uh, DI, we've got auto configuration, configuration sharing, HTTP routing, and all the fast configuration and load balancing stuff. We don't really need a lot of that for it, but it runs really good on a small thing with a very low heap size. And that's, that's where we win here versus running Grails or some other Java framework on the Pi itself. And we can do other things with uh, Micronaut, we can do things in Java, Groovy, or Kotlin. This particular one, we're using Groovy with Micronaut uh, for the most part. And, um, but we can do distributed tracing, things like that. So maybe we could have a network of these cars all talking to each other. That would be kind of slick. And we've got a CLI called the you know, Micronaut CLI. We've got profile support, and we've got the profiles repository. You can see all that stuff through the CLI. All fun stuff. 
All right, but what does Micronaut have to do with an RC car? Uh, it's quick startup and small memory footprint make this ideal for running on the Pi. So here we go. We got here's the tools Robo4j. These are the two guys that make it. They're super helpful. It's an IoT robotics library for Java. So now you can make more than just these cars. They make tank robots with lidar and all kinds of stuff. Uh, you can do there. Um, and these two guys um, got a Duke's Choice Award in 2017 for doing this. All right, so we're going to use those libraries to control our servers and motors. Uh, if you have a, uh, still have a Leg, uh, Lego EV platform type of setup, uh, I've done some workshops in the past with that many years ago. Uh, this thing supports that as well, uh, so you can have a little more control over things and still reuse that old bit of hardware. So what's Robo for J? We, we, here's the, all the components of Robo for J. So we've got uh, we've got a robot, we've got a core, we've got a math module. They actually have an onboard DB SQL module you can use. And then we're calling these our Raspberry Pi for J unit thing here. And then the hardware layer here. So if we're doing Lego, it uses the other two boxes. But uh, that's what's in Rubble for J. So you can use that in anything you want to make a little home-based Java robot with. Uh, I highly recommend you uh, check this project out. We got all that. All right, so here we get into uh, Galisano car, which is we made it nicer than the donkey name which is where it comes from, right? So we made a nice, nicer horse from Mexico. So what, what we've done here is taken all of the web UI and all that controller bits, and we've converted all that stuff to Micronaut. And we can run all of our manual controls. So when you want to drive the car manually with the camera mode and a joystick on the browser, um, you know, we're doing Micronaut for that. All right. Let's take a look at, uh, we're going to have to skip over the demo right now because the Wi-Fi these things are on does not reach into the room. So uh, the, uh, uh, we'll the be driving them around after this in the lobby. The law of demos bit us. Uh, so we will be working on uh, these and, and playing around with them tonight at the, uh, the Hacker's Garden too. So anybody that would like to come in, look at the source code, uh, play around with controlling them either through the web page or uh, through uh, the, the um, a PS3 controller, then uh, feel free. We, we would love to, to talk to you about that and spend time with the cars. Yeah. I'll show you the source here. Um, but first I want to talk about... Um, well, you know what? I'm going to show the source. There we go. Let's go. All right, so we've got a Micronaut controller right here is our starting point, and we're just mapping this to uh, the root directory. And what we did was we took the donkey car uh, HTML interface, and we basically just re replaced all of the endpoints with Micronaut endpoints, which is really easy to do with Micronaut because we can just say, um, define our methods here. We've got uh, one's called video. We've got one called uh, take still. Uh, we use that for diagnostic testing. You can basically hit take still for an endpoint, and you can just get an image back in your browser to test it out. We've got one called PWM test to make sure the car is running properly. Um, we've also got uh, forward, backward, stop, steer, but we're not, we don't use most of these. What really is called is this guy here called Drive. And what's happening is the web browser is calling, constantly hammering it with an angle and what the current throttle is and what drive mode you're in. So if you want to switch to autopilot mode, then we can fork off and do the other stuff. Otherwise, we uh, go back there. So we run this thing called Drive Scheduled. So now we've got a service here, Micronaut. It's actually a GORM data service, but it could just be a singleton. Um, if you don't need GORM support, <coughs> you go up here. So it's, instead of um, instead of doing service here, I could do at singleton and just make it a singleton bean if I'm not doing any GORM stuff, which I'm actually really not, but it's just to show you can do it. And then here we've got our drive. And one of the things that we had to write in here is sort of a buffer, right? What happens is uh, it's constantly sending commands to Micronaut, like picture, picture, drive, 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 over and over. So what we're doing is we're uh, creating a queue of the last 100 things it got, and we process that out as we go. And then at that point, we um, uh, 
throw away anything else because it's, you know, if we miss a few uh, calls in between things while it's being hammered, it's fine. doesn't really matter in the long term. Uh, and here's how we control the motors and stuff. So what we're doing is we take uh, a number for throttle between minus 1 and 1, 0 being stopped. And we basically map that out with this a range that's just a floating point number. And then we pass that in and create something called a PWM pulse. And that's what gets sent to the motor here. So we say um, start or stop. And really forward and backwards isn't necessarily a thing. Uh, it's just this PWM frequency number. So a motor will take a PWM frequency usually between, uh, you know, 0 and 400 or 500 or something like that. And it uh, depends what frequency you're calling it at. And then we come up with that number, and that's what activates the motor to go. And it requires these kind of motors that have a sort of a safety mechanism built in. You have to give it an initialization PWM frequency, or the motors won't go anywhere. So once you initialize it to the right frequency, then the motor's ready to go. And that's just to prevent, like, uh, they do this commonly in RC rockets and planes and stuff. It's just to keep the thing from inadvertently taking off when it powers on uh, and, you know, you break it. A lot of these things can get expensive, unlike these. And what else we got? We got a camera here. So we take a, uh, if we're not in autopilot mode, we have control of the camera because we have to share it sometimes. Uh, we can take pictures with the little pie camera, and we're basically just taking pictures constantly and then sending, sending them uh, back to the web browser interface. So here's how we do all of that stuff. It's just uh, getting a byte array and then sending that back on through. So if we go back to the controller, this video call here, We just have to set this in Micronaut to HTTP response byte, and then we can just throw an image back at it in byte format. So, and here's how we build it up in Micronaut. We can just create a header. Um, for it to work right with a UI, I have to set this very specific header uh, that I've got set here, and this is how you do it in Micronaut. So it's not angry about it. And I've also got cores support. We're using the core support built, built in here, because sometimes the UI is running separately. Uh, from Micronaut, and that's cool. <coughs> All right, so let's go back. So let's I'll talk a little bit about how the AI works, because that's I found that stuff pretty neat here. Uh, let's talk about what Keras is. Uh, Keras is a basically a um, model that takes all of the input and then turns it into you know uh, outputs. So uh, it's a TensorFlow raw by itself is very difficult to work with. So these guys had made this system that takes maps and convolutions, takes samples of those maps, and then breaks it down uh, through a training process, which takes a while. Uh, it takes, can take hours if you're running the training on the Pi itself. Uh, if you can run it on your computer and get all that set up properly, then it's much faster. But still, it would be even faster with a powerful NVIDIA GPU. But basically, we're going through taking samples, uh, we're taking telemetry, like Lee said, we've got, um, and I can show you actually what that input comes from, but we've got the throttle, steering angle, and in the image itself. Let's see, tub. So if I just look at one of these, this is what it does when it's training. This is the input. So we just basically tell it uh, the array to the image, angle, and throttle, and that's it. That's, so that's the only inputs it takes. Uh, and then it's going to do that uh, as the input to learn. And then what happens is we get a, uh, after that, we get a model for we run the training. And it's basically just this uh, binary file here that's three megabytes. And it's binary, so there's no point in me showing it to you in a hex editor. But that's, that's, that's the input that Keras takes. And then the output comes out of that is that model file. And then we're just going to run that model file on the Pi. So but that's, this, this is all part of a convolutional neural network. So we're basically trying to think it, train it to think like a human would, right? We don't say, if you see this go left or if you see this go right. We're just feeding it raw data, and then it's going to figure out how to drive based on uh, everything we've fed it. And if our training is good enough and our... Uh, data, tra data training is good enough, then it will work. 
So this is probably the most common uh, high-level neural networks API. Uh, it's written in Python, so we're going to be actually ditching this uh, for deep learning for J. The other one that's popular uh, is CNTK or Theano. Um, but the, they're all using the same kind of thing, convolutional <laughs> neural network, or they use that lingo CNN for short. We're going to replace that with uh, deep learning for J. All right, so after we train on the track, we get that model, and then we import it into Keras. That's what the training happens with, and then we're going to run that model when we're done. Uh, here's the instructions here in the donkey car project. We're just using the same ones uh, to train it. All right, TensorFlow. Uh, has anyone here messed with TensorFlow? It's a lot, big buzzword with machine learning a lot lately. Um, I see uh, these uh, data TensorFlow guys I hang out with. They are doing all kinds of things that were crazy, including the guy from Uber that had the self-driving car that ran over someone in Arizona. They took the video feed of the guy driving the car around, they analyzed how long it would take for him to fall asleep, <laughs> and did their own neural, le neural network learning on that, and it, that's how they discovered, basically, the guy sat there for too long, and he would fall asleep, and then the car would start, you know, he wouldn't be there to stop it when it was about to run someone over, and it, which is exactly what happened, unfortunately. Um, I also know a guy that uses TensorFlow. He analyzes radar detector data in the trunk of his car with a bunch of CUDA core boxes and trying to figure out if you know, he's getting false hits from his radar detector or how real they are. Uh, people take this stuff to all kinds of extremes. But Google makes this machine learning framework. Uh, as Guillaume had demoed the other day, they got a really nice API through Google Cloud where you don't have to do all the TensorFlow stuff raw manually. You can call a really nice service and say, oh, I want you know, the labels for the images or uh, um, OCR or uh, things like that. Uh, it's certainly uh, something very useful if you don't need it in real time, uh, but you just want that kind of fe features for your application. That's a really uh, good use of it. But the pilots from Keras feeds the data in TensorFlow, and that's the engine that's actually running the model underneath. It's just TensorFlow is so terse, they've made this Keras model on top of that, so it's somewhat understandable code-wise uh, when you're building it out. So uh, the problem is you can run TensorFlow for Java on a PC, but you can't run it on the, the Pies because they don't support JNI 32-bit libraries. Hopefully they'll uh, fix that. There is a ticket in their system for it. And you can create models for anything. I've seen there's a, a library here. Um, I've got a slide for interesting projects. You can make it, you know, AI artwork, uh, lip reading, uh, chat robots, object recognition, touch things, all kinds of neat things. If you check this out, this is all the cool things people have made with TensorFlow. It's <laughs> some pretty amazing stuff. All right, let's talk about the donkey car project that this stuff was kind of based on. It was the inspiration for doing all this stuff. Um, that was originally a Python project. So we basically have ported that uh, to Groovy and Java through Micronaut. And again, um, Deep Learning for J is a problem on the Pi right now, and so does TensorFlow because of the Basil tool. So uh, that's why we're not all 100% there yet, but that's part of our next steps in the future. All right, we already talked about the code here. We got our controller, uh, we showed you that, and basically, we can use uh, post-construct uh, setup methods here, so that's how you initialize things. So if you want something to run only once when it starts, you can just tag this with post-construct and then um, initialize the motors for the car and you're good to go. And we got our video method here, how we take an image, goes all the way through to our service. Uh, here's how we drive the car. And we just return data back here that says OK and what the angle and throttle is, just for diagnostic purposes, really. And we take the picture. And here's our service for initializing the motor. So we're basically here we can see us delaying for a second, uh, set up our queue, and then we set throttle frequencies here for forward and backward, or forward and stopped. So we basically just start it really quick, wait a second, stop, and then we know the motors are initialized and ready to go. And then here's how we take pictures. Um, there's extra checking of stuff here in case we're switching back and forth from autopilot to manual mode. And here's all the logic in our drive thread that's going through our queue, processing everything, whether it's a command to go forward or stop. 
Uh, so at any point, you can shut this thing off or try to catch it if it's running away, which we've had to do quite a bit. Here's how we steer. So this is using the, these are APIs that are using Robo4j. So uh, they've abstracted this thing uh, for the 9865 device. That's the um, PWM controller that we took, stick on our Pi here, that second board. So that's really what Robo4j is doing for us here in this case. We set the PWM, PWM frequency. Uh, we've had to do a lot of trial and error, but 50 for steering is apparently the magic number. Uh, the Robofer guys are really cool, super helpful. We had a problem with the steering for a long time. Turned out we just had a bad servo, but uh, they're really helpful guys. And we can set trim. So trim is like an adjustment of steering, right? So if it straight isn't quite straight, you can give it a trim to correct it a little bit. And that, that you know, we just call that over and over again to steer. Uh, we do put a delay in here because it's flooding it with so many commands at once. Uh, if it it needs a, a, a time to actually do the steer, right, before it gets another command to go the other direction. So we have a sleep thread in here basically to force pause it in, in that case or it'll never actually do anything. It'll just be twitching the motors and not going forward or steering or anything. And here's how we initialize the throttle also here. Uh, we set the PDM frequency. These are all Robo4j library calls here inside of Micronaut. And here's how we drive forward. Basically, we just come down, calculate what the PDM frequency will be based on the th throttle joystick on the web browser, and then uh, let it go for a second before we change the throttle again. All right, the future. Are you doing the future? OK. All right, so <coughs> currently we're at um, you know, building, the, building the version of Donkey Car using uh, Micronaut, and we've been working on this actually since it was called Particle before it was long before it was released, way back the beginning of the year. And so as it's been progressing, we've been adjusting it to work on the car. Uh, you know, converted all that code for Robo4j. Uh, the next step is to replace Keras and TensorFlow with Deep Learning for J, which is made for Java people. Uh, I guess the part of the community got together and decided they didn't really love this. Java support in TensorFlow, so they made this other library called Deep Learning for J that's completely independent of that. And that, that's the most promising at, at this point, unless the Java support just gets a lot better in TensorFlow. So there, there's a link to the library if you want to check it out. It can be used for all kinds of interesting things. You don't have to be an AI expert to do these too, so you can mess around with this stuff and uh, you like the car or anything else and makes, make neat things. There's the ticket right there that's broken for the Pi. That's why we're not using that yet. All right, so we're going to add more hardware. So currently, it doesn't have an accelerometer or anything like that, right? It, it can't really tell its velocity. It <coughs> knows that the throttle's going at a certain frequency, which is going to go. But it doesn't really know how fast it's going. It doesn't take any of that into account. So uh, adding an accelerometer would really help it, um, and improving the autopilot, things like that. Um, also, talking about adding a LiDAR. So uh, the Robo4j guys that I talked to, they use, they're not using deep learning for driving their robots around, but they're uh, more of like a reactionary type of model that's just, re you know, if you see this thing, turn the other way kind of deal, but they use LiDAR for that. So it's all self-controlling and uh, neat like that. You want to talk about the AWS recognition stuff? And sure. Yeah, with the, um, with the LiDAR, uh, that's going to give us object detection. We'll be able to tell if something's out there. But uh, um, when, when you start looking at, uh, at trying to, to make the AI on here mimic what we do behind the wheel of a car, it's not enough for us to know that something's out in front of our car. Uh, we need to know what it is. If it's a car, or if it's a person, or if it's a dog, or if it's a tree, we're going to handle things differently. So um, eventually we want to go and take a lot of this telemetry and um, move it up to uh, the cloud somewhere and use uh, some um, of the cloud-based machine learning. Uh, AWS recognition comes uh, to mind as something we would like to use because we can take these images, pop it through recognition, and uh, that's a service that will analyze the, the uh, images and just tell us what's in the picture. So um, if we detect that there's an object out there and recognition says, it's a person, we will know what to do um, and how to, to handle it. And we can treat, teach the uh, AI to be a little bit more robust then. 
So uh, it will be object det uh, detection and avoidance, but uh, also object identification as well. Uh, we also want to do road sharing too. And um, we've got two cars because uh, we've got both Ryan and myself and didn't want to fight over one. But eventually, uh, we want to put both of these on the same track, being the same AI and um, guiding just two different vehicles. So they'll need to know how are they going to, to deal with each other. If one's going faster, how is it going to pass? If the other is uh, going slow, will it let uh, the, uh, the faster one by? So uh, there, there will be a lot more, um, more uh, interaction between them as well. Phase four is going to be a really, really big one as far as the maturity of the AI goes. Um, and of course, it's built up upon all the things that we wanted to do previously. We can also make them talk to each other. We'd love, a to, not. love to do that. So what we don't have planned is we're not going to put GPS in there because let's face it, these are 1 16th scale. So if we put a full scale GPS on there, that's going to be a bunch of data that really doesn't do us any good at all. Um, we're not going to scale up. 1 16th is good. Uh, I don't think we're going to get any bigger. Ryan and I certainly have no plans to do a full-size vehicle unless one of you guys would like to pay us. We can negotiate that later. <laughs> we'll crash your car for you. So uh, we want to give a special thanks to a couple of people. And um, the first is a gentleman named Todd Higgins. He is essentially our mechanic on, uh, on the RC portion of the chassis. Um, he, uh, he's helped us tune it a little bit. We even had uh, one of our first experimental runs. Um, the car broke its own drivetrain. Uh, Todd helped us uh, replace that as well as uh, our bad servo. Uh, we've got Charles Grossman who helped us out with a bunch of uh, the, the coding UI. Yeah, the UI. and the UI portions. Um, Justin Howe, who has gone and modified all of the images within uh, this presentation. Thank you, Justin. And then the robo for j team, uh, Marcus and Miro, uh, wherever you guys are out there in Cyberland, thank you very much. Uh, so we, we do have a bunch of uh, resources and links for you guys to use. All of these are um, going to be part of the slide deck, which is distributable here. So uh, I'm Lee Fox. Feel free to uh, tweet at me or email me. That is Ryan Vanderwerf. You can tweet at him and email him as well. We also have the source code for this project already published out on GitHub, so we need to add the link for that in there. We um, probably should have. Yeah, that's yes. probably mm -hmm. important. Good idea. So uh, we'll make sure we get that in there as well so you can uh, get the source code yourself and play around with it. You know, we build your own car and take it from there. Uh, see, we've got seven minutes left. Does anyone have any questions about this stuff? Yes, sir. Uh, for it's the uh, the default battery that comes with the car. Um, I have no idea. It's a cheap nickel nickel metal hydride battery. It comes with, um, which has this hilarious set of instructions. So it tells you when to charge the battery in the car to build a bunker out of concrete and sand, stick it in the sand and plug it in, or it may burn your house down. Like just normal directions you'd get an electronic thing you'd buy at the store, right? <laughs> yeah, so. it's just standard little. <laughs> Yeah. Battery. You can upgrade those to lithium ion. The, the car has a jumper mode. You can switch it from nickel metal hydride to lithium ion mode. Uh, so a lot of people upgrade the batteries for more runtime, and you can buy those separately. But the, the, the one it comes with is works for a while. You can drive it around for an hour or two before the battery's dead. Yes. Uh, we have not gotten to the point where uh, we have done that. Uh, honestly, um, we are still trying to, to get our, our heads around uh, the whole AI thing, and um, we're, we're really excited about those uh, new, uh, new libraries that Ryan had mentioned, and we think that's really going to accelerate it. So while uh, we've gone and on our track at home have completed multiple laps, the performance time was the very last thing on our mind. Yeah. We, we wanted completion. Yeah. 
So, yeah, completion time is, is good. It is really hard to control these cars. You have to, uh, they can go about 20 miles an hour, so uh, we have to set the throttle down to like 40 or 50 percent to be able to actually drive it around and not crash into things constantly. So, because it's really tricky to train it, because you need to do like at least 10 laps around your track without like going all over the outside the lines, right? Because then you're just training it to be a drunk driver, so we don't want that. <laughs> and that's kind of what we got going on out there if you've seen us monkeying around with it uh, the last day or so. It's, it's kind of a drunk driver right now. Stop by tonight at the, uh, the Hacker's Garden, and uh, we'll give you a chance to, to do it. It's very much an interesting, um, interesting uh, experience. Almost as interesting as the very first time you see this thing take off by itself. Um, so when, when we're back home working on this, uh, I, I essentially have a workshop out in my garage. There's a big projector on the wall uh, that we, we screencast to. And, um, but the track for, you saw the picture earlier in the presentation, the track is inside the house. It's on Wi-Fi, so we're good. Uh, we put the car inside, Ryan and I are in the garage, and we've got the image up on, on the projector of what the car is seeing. One, two, three, go. It took off, bounced into three walls, and you're seeing everything from this low angle of the car until <laughs> the entire world goes upside down and stops moving. And it snapped the axle. Yes. So, yeah, we've had to buy a couple extra parts. We have a third car that we've taken parts off of, of things that broke. As I saw another question over here earlier. Yep. yep. All right, well, hit us up if you think of anything later. We'll be around. Oh, wait, one more. So uh, the, the people that um, started this project, uh, the, the donkey, donkey car, car people, group, yeah. uh, they've done a lot. And uh, there is a, a, a simulator where uh, you, can, you can run it, and uh, they've got three different tracks on there. Uh, one of the tracks is even randomly generated. And then uh, you, could, you set the, uh, the car, you set a couple other uh, bits of, of information, and the throttle speed, and uh, have it take off, and it will generate excuse me, it will generate training data for you. Now, I've tried to use that, but I ha I've not been successful in taking that data to train either of these two cars. Maybe one day. All right, thank you.